Keegan Road. You all recognise the former pub, now Tesco Express, um, in the middle of Green Meadow. But I'm here now with Richard Davis, who's the founder of the Ancient Cumbrian Society. And we're going to have a bit of fun. We're going to have a walk through this part of town. He's going to point out a few things, starting over there in the distance towards Killian. And then a few things right in front of us, including these two huge rocks and that beautiful hedge behind us. It takes on a bit of a walking tour through Green Meadow and sort of, I mean, we know Cumbrian's a new town, but what you've discovered is there's a lot more to this town than meets the eye. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ancient landscape um, going back, well, we know for a certain it's going back uh, three and a half thousand years, uh, possibly much older. I mean, the oldest thing that was ever found in Cumbrian was when they were building um, Fairwater High School. They found a, a Mesolithic hand axe, which goes back about 6,000 years. What is that? Uh, it was a, a, a stone axe for, for chopping trees down. But, um, yeah, it's in Cardiff Museum. It's an awesome, awesome piece of kit. When we first met him about five minutes ago, before we started to chat, you pointed over into the distance, right over there. Yeah. Tell us what we can see. If someone stood here, right by Tesla Express. Well, if you can see the tree line in the distance, the, the, the last hill before the sky, yeah, that's, um, that's Lodge Hill. That's uh, uh, an Iron Age fort of Killian. Um, we know it's uh, dated at 500 BC when it was started, so this, we also know that Killian would have been a, quite a large port and town 500 years before the Romans got here. So, you know, this is, this is an ancient landscape. Um, and now, later on, uh, the lordship of Killian went from the top of our mountain here, Manneth Mine, down to Killian. So Cumbran was built in Killian. You know, uh, it might sound a little strange to you, but um, the medieval towns were about six kilometers square. You know, and the most important buildings were put on the edge. Hence, uh, uh, down there, that's one edge of Killian. Up the top of the mountain, there's, a, there's an old abbey site uh, called Clan Derville, and uh, that's the other edge of Killian. So we're, it all sort of links together in a nice line, because I mean, you mentioned, I mean, there's a couple of rocks behind you, there's a beautiful hedge. Yeah. used to run across to, towards the high school. Yeah. Where do we go next? Right, well, we're going to, we're going to go and have a look at the, um, the ancient road that runs from Lodge Hill to Tumbalum. Yeah. It's uh, just over there, uh, St. Dal's Road, you would know it as, it comes up through Old Cumbran. Uh, we're going to have a look at a piece of it that's never been uh, developed or messed around with. And then from there, we'll go up into Green Meadow Woodland and we're going to have a look at some ancient walls and some Bronze Age burial mounds. Let's but go. before that, Ooh, yes. before that, I want to draw your attention to this stuff. This is, um, this is uh, called uh, Quartz Conglomerate. It's, um, it's an ancient... Side. I'm just going to look at the oh, okay. Yeah, jump around. I'm going to... It's an ancient seabed. It's um, 350 million years old. It was made on the coast of Africa before the, when, when uh, this part of the world was one continent called Eurasia. And um, these little quartz nobblers in it are 500 million years old. They were made in volcanoes by metamorphosizing metals and then they were blown out of the top of a volcano and they landed in the sea and became a seabed. And that's what this is, the seabed. Now there's an outcrop of this just above Thornhill that runs right across South Wales. It outcrops just above Craig Lane in Thornhill. Craig Lane is, uh, Craig means ridge of stone, you know, so now this stuff is really important in the Bronze Age and in the early Christian period. The standing stones on the other side of the valley are made out of this and they're like Bronze Age, three and a half thousand years old. And um, the walls in the woods here in Cumbran are made out of this, you know, sacred stuff, sacred stone. And these two stones, I say, there's another landmark, there's Tesco Express over there. You said at one point they were nearly, because these, these were 
close to the Golden Harvest. Is that right? They were kind of they were they were in the they were in the car park of the Golden Harvest. They were right beside of the road there. And then oh, when they yes, developed the car right. park by there and by there. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. They widened the entrance of the car park and they were gonna throw them away like you know. So I intervened and got the council to put them over by here. Now we they are they they're marking the wall that that came down from Green Meadow Woods that ran all the way from uh, up by Penlang Gwyn, up uh, Mono Court, above Mono Court, yeah, in Thornhill. And I, I'm pretty sure it ran all the way down to Teacoak, you know, uh, to Clan Dowless Farm, or the enclosure of the Dowless. And it's one continuous wall, it's huge engineering undertake, uh, um, construction, but um, this marks where a lane runs through. Now the lane was, like you said, come from St. Giles and it went over to Fairwater. And, and I find where the, where the wall um, uh, meets uh, uh, a crossing, you find larger stones placed on that cross. You know, I think there would have been walling of this type running all the way across the Fairwater. There's certainly enough evidence of it in the Byways estate. There's quite a lot of large stone there. But um, the builders of the estates obviously found it a bit difficult to move, so they just pushed it to the side and made a feature out of it. I watched um, the JCB trying to move this stone from over there to here, and they really struggled. A, a block of stone like that is, oh, I would say about um, a good ton, ton and a half in weight, you know? And they, these were chucked around by a, by a group of Silurian tribesmen, you know, <laughs> thousands of years ago with no JCBs. <laughs> it's My amazing, father, isn't, it? isn't it? That is. So shall we um, walk over yeah. to St. Dale's Road? You, you might have commented about these hedges here as well, didn't you? Is yeah, it, this again, was, it's more of when this you were younger. The, edge of, the yeah. edge of the lane. So the, the lane, all the lanes would have hedges, yeah. So you can. You can tell really, that's a, that's a hawthorn tree there, that's an ancient hawthorn. And then you've got a holly, and, and they're a typical sort of hedge. I remember it being a hedge, and I remember it yeah. being a lane when I was a child, you know? And uh, more quartz conglomerate. It's not, it's not impossible that these are carved. But this is actually carved into a shape to represent something. You know, as a pointer stone. We know they could carve it. We've got examples of this stone being carved in Cumbria. There's a, there's a millstone over in, um, uh, oh, what's it called? Oaksford? Oaksford in, in Coidiva. Yeah. And uh, it's, like a, it's like a Mexican hat. And it's, it's, uh, it's for crushing apples. And it's just plonked in the middle of the estate there on the side of some grass. You, find it next to some pear trees up there and um, that was carved out of this stone at this quartz conglomerate. It's really hard, you know? These, these, little, these little quartz uh, nobblers, they're like diamonds. There's not, there's not anything much harder than this, than di maybe diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> diamond. <laughs> I'm, just chat. I'm using, um, just, I'm using a, a little microphone today because there's a bit of wind. I'm guessing the sound's okay. If there's any problems, let us know. But yeah, so far so good. Is it quite windy up here in um, Bowleys? I was walking through to, is it near the Pixie Park, we said? Yeah. And then the footpath we're going to pick up on the road. It's a, a very modern name for it, the Pixie Park, isn't it? <laughs> um, I, I don't ever remember it being called the Pixie Park when I was a child, <laughs> but uh, it is these days. Yeah, St. Giles Road, um, it runs, it runs uh, what's left of it runs from uh, Oak and Bran, uh, where St. Gabriel's Church is, comes up over the hill, yeah, and then it comes through uh, just by the roundabout by Green Meadow Farm, yeah, and then the, the roundabout and the roads there cut, it, cut through it, and then there's a small section of it running up to the side of the Bowleys here, isn't it? Yeah. Now, um, someone in their infinite wisdom has, has named it, uh, translated St. Giles Road to St. Derville's Road here in Welsh. Now, uh, I think that's a bit of a leap of imagination, really. But we, we, 
the Ancient Cumbrian Society done a lot of research on the name St. Giles, trying to work out what St. Giles meant. Yeah. It's a, it's a rather strange... You stand, you stand with the sign and show this egg on. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a rather strange this is the name. Lane, yeah. it's, um, it's, neither, it's neither Welsh nor English. Giles, Giles it can't be part of the Welsh language and it can't be part of the English language because this IA is just a bit strange, you know? It's a sound, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, we, we researched it and we come up with two possibilities. Yeah? It's either a, an, an anglicisation of a, a, a saint called Saint Dulas, who was in this area in about the 5th, 6th century, or it's an um, abbreviation of the Dialogues of the Saints, which is a Catholic um, church document that was produced very early on in the Catholic Church as a handbook, an instruction of how you conduct a, a, a monastic settlement. And, and this, running down to, this road running down to Lantanam Abbey, where the Catholic Cistercian monks were settled in 1179, well, it could be something to do with that. Especially as where they built the police training college, there was a farm called St. Giles, and there was a small um, building on the side of it that appeared to be some kind of chapel, a chapel of rest. Now, we know Lantanum Abbey, the Cistercians, were running a pilgrimage, and they were running it from Lantanum Abbey up to Clan Derville. Yeah? It's the devil, yeah? Now, Saint Derval, he's a great character. This is a sixth century warrior monk, you know, that in, in Welsh history fought with King Arthur at the last battle of Camelan or on Arthur's side. And he was he's in Welsh poetry as one of the, the seven survivors of the Battle of Camelan, you know? And he survived through the strength of his spear, you know. And uh, wonderful wonderful poems because there's one of the poems talks about uh, one knight surviving because he was so ugly that everybody thought he was a demon and was frightened to fight him. And then there was another knight that survived uh, because he was so beautiful, everyone thought he was an angel and wouldn't go near him. <laughs> it's great stuff, like, you know. But um, St. Derval, he's famous uh, as a, a, a warrior saint. People believed that he could go into hell and get your relatives out of purgatory. So he was very popular. His Saint's Day was about the 4th or 5th of April, we're not quite sure which day. And uh, the Cistercian monks were making an absolute fortune out of pilgrims coming up this track to St. Derval's and paying oblations for the privilege. It's an oblation? Uh, oblation uh, is a donation, um, a, a payment. Now, most of it would have been in like sheep or bales of wheat or, or wine or it would have been objects because in 1500 most people didn't have money but we've got a record from 1530 something I think I'm not quite sure exactly early 1500s of the ecclesiastical taxilia of the time which is how much the monks made, right? Now they only put down the money because this is a report to the crown, so they had to pay tax on it, yeah? So they only put the money they took. But bear in mind, in the 1500s, most people didn't have money and didn't handle money. Everything was done with bartering, yeah? But they, they gathered an equivalent amount of money that would have been something like in the hundreds of thousands of pounds now. In our in our in our terms, you know, but um, that that was only the money. So we figured that there was about six or seven thousand pilgrims coming up here every year, and this was the third biggest holy shrine in Wales. So this this area is this huge ecclesiastical history, you know. So it's. When I say um, sacred sites of Cumbran, what I'm referring to is there's a, a continuity of religion going on here that goes back 
to the Bronze Age. Well, it goes back to the Mesolithic because that Stone Age axe that they found over Fairwater, they didn't throw them away. They ritually placed them in the ground. And the same with the, the Bronze Age um, uh, flint arrowheads they found on Tumbalam. They're not thrown away. They didn't lose things like that. They were very valuable objects. They were placed in the ground as a ritual offering. You know? And then we up into the Christian, we got a pilgrim site here, but even before the Cistercians in the 11th, 12th century uh, were running pilgrimage up here, well of course, Clan Derval, St. Derval, he's 6th century. This is really early Christianity, you know, this is early stuff. So you've got a continuity of this being a sacred religious landscape over three and a half thousand years. It's remarkable, isn't it? It's remarkable. Let's take a little walk up the pilgrim route, shall we? There's a um, brilliant. This is the um Shumani where we are so the right now sort of St. Dal's Road down to the roundabout, and you grow in a community farm. And the road does the road end here? It's where no, the footpath picks up. No, it just hasn't been developed. Ah right yeah. It goes up from here. They give you a nice feel of what it was originally like. It's um it's a real pretty little spot. Let's hope there's not too much uh, like tipping and lifting going on in here. Um, the Eco Warriors of Brand did come up here a couple of weeks ago and clear it. But, uh, you know, things soon fill up. They're very clever, these roads, you know. They were, they were ever so clever. I mean, you can walk up here in the pouring rain and stay pretty dry. You can walk up here in the baking heat and stay pretty cool. It's, it's clever it's stuff. Very, yeah, yeah. There's a very good logic to it. Yeah, I see what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah. Well, we cut, uh, cut out a ditch. We, in the early part of the ancient Cumbran and Cistercians project that we uh, run in Torbay, there was a project officer on that. And um, I sort of put the put the project together with the help of the heritage officer at all by Claire Derry. And we done a the first archaeological dig we done with the project, we done here. On this stretch? On this stretch, I'll show yeah. you where. And we, we cut a trench across it. Across the path. Just about now you notice this look. Big lumps okay. of quartz conglomerate. You find them all the way along the ancient roads and trackways in Cumbria. Another There's block. Another, another block. And by here, we cut a trench across there. We went down a couple of foot, yeah, and we put another trench across the top of the bank there, yeah, and we found a medieval cobble path up there. And here we found nothing except a drainage ditch running down the centre. But that was a few feet down. So we're going back a probably a few thousand years, you know, to 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 uncover that. Um, so the drainage was the drainage was included. So is it a good route to walk on? Is that is that there? Well, yeah. I, I, so the, these are roads. Everyone gets this weird idea that. Um, there was no roads in Britain until the Romans turned up and built them, which is absolute nonsense, like, you know, because Britain was trading with the, the rest of the world thousands of years before that. And if you're trading, yeah, and namely we were trading in copper, tin and iron ore, you know. Now, to get those substances to the coast, you've got to have roads <laughs> and anything else you want to trade. Well, Britain was also, before the Romans come here, famous for its hoodies. We invented the hoodie, yeah, which was a cloak with a hood. Yeah? And we also invented trousers and socks. And we were trading this with the rest of the world way before the Romans come here. They knew all about this place, you know. They knew how wealthy it was. That's why they come here. Now, we had to have roads to get our goods to the coast so we can send them by ship to the Mediterranean or whatever they were going, yeah? So there was loads of roads and they were already built and then when the Romans came along, 
Of course, the Romans took over the country. They had to, they had to deal with the logistics of trading as well. So obviously they improved the roads or they rebuilt, uh, built a couple new ones, you know, but generally the roads are already yeah. here. People get the wrong ideas here. Just because someone lived a few thousand years ago, they weren't stupid. Yeah. <laughs> they were exactly the same as me yeah. and you. A dry Just, thing to walk on to transport goods more quickly to the coast or to their Yeah. And they, they, had, they had horses and they had horse-drawn carriages. And they were famed, the Silus of this area of Gwent and Glamorgan, who took on the Roman Empire and held it out of Wales for 30 years. I mean, that's, that's remarkable in itself, mm. right? They were famous for being a, a, a charity, a chariot cavalry sort of army. And they caused the Romans masses problems, you know? So oh, someone's coming along. <laughs> the dog walker behind us. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cheers. How's it going, Uncle Beck? Oh, yeah, well. How's it going, right? Yeah, all good, but doing a bit of history stuff. I thought it was when I see you down here, there. I didn't recognise you coming up there for a minute. Coming right up here into the woods and all, yeah? Yeah, yeah. That's why I take the dog. I can remember you showing me all the stones and all. Yeah. yeah. Have a good run. I know. Have a good <laughs> ah, well, it's my nephew. Who knows the stones as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've um, we've done dig after dig after dig, and we've been running the Ancient Cumbrian Society now for over ten years, and uh, we've got a website. You can you can go and you can go and see the archaeological reports mm. if you want. You know. So. Should we, yep. should we carry on up the pilgrim route? Up the pilgrim route. Yep. Yeah. Walk in the footsteps of thousands of artisans. As the, 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 the ex-leader of the council used to refer to it, Bob Wellington. <laughs> You're walking in the footsteps of thousands of artisans. <laughs> I don't know why he referred to them as artisans. But it sounds good, doesn't it? These beech trees are planted everywhere. Yeah. We figure this might be the Cistercian planting beech. Because um, they used it to coppice to make charcoal. Which was their fuel, like you know. And uh, people get the wrong idea about these monasteries and these monastic sites. They were they were industry. They would have had an iron works in, in Lantalam Abbey. It wouldn't have been this serene, peaceful place. It would have been a hive of industrial activity. And that's why the Lord of Caleum Fuel got the monks to set up an abbey here. Because it would bring employment, it would bring a school, it would bring a hospital, yeah. And all of these would be free to the locals. So uh, they want a bad move to get them to come. Um, we're going to hit the road now. I never knew this footpath road was here at the end of this lane. More, more, quartz. more quartz. Now they built the road straight through this uh, ancient track, yeah? We go out by here. Um, see where it's going. You see it going straight up through Fawn Hill. And the main footpath running through the centre of Fawn Hill, that's the same route, that's the pilgrim route. And you'll notice all along that footpath there's large blocks of quartz conglomerate. It's fascinating stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it all links together, you know. Well, it goes up, Very organized. It goes up onto the ridge the road and then it does a sharp left and it goes runs across the side of the mountain it goes through Clan Derville Farm and then on to Tumbalam then the track drops down by Tumbalam down into Risca these are major roads like you know yeah. see where the tree line is up on the top of the mountain there yeah that's, this track goes up and then across there. It's remarkable. It's remarkable they ever got planning permission to build this town in this place. Didn't say that before. Yeah. It's 
got to be one of the most archaeologically important and historically important places in the whole of Britain. Just crossing one of the many banana bridges. Yep. Across Tugan Road. There you are. Lodge Hill again. Gives another point. See the trees, the yeah. tree line? You're going to see the, the, the mountains on the other side of the Severn back there, can't you? And then you can see a tree, a tree line going up and down. A bit lumpy, but sort of Malpuses were there. The edge of Cleans over that side. That's Lodge Hill. That's a Iron Age fort of the Silurians, built 500 BC, like most of the Silurian forts. There's 50 of them in Gwent, in the old county of Gwent, and that's the only one that's ever had any archaeology done on it. So the others are known, but hasn't been the, the depth no of... No one's dug them. Knowledge. It's really difficult to... The, the, the Cadu won't allow just anybody to dig on them, obviously. But um, fortunately, Killian had an archaeological department. So Professor Ray Howell was allowed to conduct a dig on there. Only a small dig. They did find out a few things. They find out, found out that it was started in 500 BC. They found that there was a, it was um, slighted when the Romans turned up and then after the Romans left, it was re-established. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big theory that King Arthur was from Killian, you know? That could be Camelot. <laughs> well, we'll carry on up. We'll uh, come off the come off the pilgrim route now and cut up through the houses here and head for Green Meadow Woods, which is just over there. But yeah, I think it's easier to access what we're looking at this way. There's a few um, sort of local Facebook groups and pages, you know, come around past and present. Yes. I bet you see them and think, there's a whole lot more than just black and white pictures of Old Grand. Yeah, well... <laughs> old houses. Yeah, but um, that's relevant, that's history as well. Yeah. But um, we, we concentrate mainly on the ancient history. You know, they're, they're looking at industrial history. But... Um, it's all, it's all relevant. People are interested in different yeah. periods of history, isn't it? I've always been interested in the, in the tribal history of the area and the early, the early Christian history because, because they're rather significant in, the, in Britain. The Silus, the Romans called them the Silurians, which means the people of the rocks. They probably called themselves something closer to Silach, but um, we don't know for certain. We got no, we got no written evidence. We've got evidence of them writing in Latin at Carwent, and they're calling themselves Silurians there. And uh, we know that was their capital. Uh, we're not sure exactly how. The war, the Romans referred to it as the Silurian War. We're not quite sure how that pitted out. The, the only reference to it in Roman writing is that the Romans subdued the Silurians. There's no victory talked about. We know they lost a couple of governors of Britain fighting them. We know they lost a, quite a few legions in this area trying to get India. And we know it went on for a minimum of 25 years. It's a long time. Wow. It's a long That's war. Long. Now, for the Silurians to take on the Roman Empire, and they were taking on a big empire with a lot of troops. You know, there was thousands and thousands of Roman troops in Britain. And to hold them at bay and meant that they must have had quite a formidable army themselves. You know? The Romans did say that the Silurians' landscape was as ferocious as their warriors. They also mentioned that the women 
were rather ferocious in the area as well. <laughs> which which uh, not a lot's changed. <laughs> Benefits both sides, yeah, the traditional. Well, yeah. This is... So where's the... The surgery way, where's that disappeared to now? Where have we, we yeah. lost to come off it? See where the bus stop is? Comes across there. And, then it, and it, runs, it runs all the way up, right up to the centre of, of uh, Fawn Hill, until it gets to the, It goes alongside the allotments on the top, and then comes up to the row of cottages up there, where Sam the Spud Man's cottage used to be, yeah? And then there's a little track going up the side of there. That's really steep. Uh, people used to call the pony track. I don't know what they refer to it anymore. And then when you get on the top of that, where just above that electricity pylon and those trees, yeah? The, um, the track runs across there to Clanderville Farm. And it goes right through Clandervil Farm. It's a public footpath, you're allowed to walk it. And as you get past Clandervil Farm, if you look in the field above you, you'll see a ruin of a chapel. That's St. Derville's Chapel. You know, that's where they were running the pilgrim route, uh, pilgrimages to. But the track carries on past there and goes on to Tumbala. So, you know, uh, whether there was a road originally from One Iron Age Fort Tumbala to Lodge Hill, or and uh, Cistercians utilised that to make it a pilgrim route, or it was a pilgrim route, and then later on it became a track to Tumbalam as well. I suspect I, su I suspect the former, uh, because if you go to Tumbalam, there's another road running from Tumbalam down to another Iron Age fort at the Gare in Newport, and it runs directly to it. So you've got like a triangle of these Iron Age forts about. And each one is about six kilometres apart. She said the start that was sort of the size of the. Was it not the ears? How would you describe it? The, the six, the six, the six, 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 six kilometre. Yeah, six kilometre triangle. Yeah. Um, the thing is with Tumbalam. If you sit on top of Tumbalam, you can see anybody coming up the River Seven from miles and miles away. Yeah. It wouldn't take very much for you to put a man up there, right, to watch the coast, and then he could warn um, the Gareport, which overlooks the estuary of the Usk, yeah, which, and he could also warn Lodge Hill Fort, you know, so they could they could they could not only stop them on the estuary of the Usk by the Gare, yeah, but they could also stop them get into Killeen because there's a nice big bend on the on the edge of the fort on the river S by Killeen. You know, so they it sort of makes the, the whole place pretty uh, Str impregnable. Strong air. Yeah. yeah. Because they, they, they got an early warning system. And of course if you're up to Mbalam you can see all the way to Cardiff. You can see all the way up uh, up Avonmouth up the River Severn that way as well. So, and you can even see the Brecon Beacons. So you, it's a formidable viewpoint, you know, so, uh, as an early warning system for any tribal people. So like, we're probably here in the heart of Siluria. <laughs> Which is great, no. Start a campaign to rename, rename this area. Yeah, well, Siluria became the Kingdom of Gwent. Across the way, yeah. And the Kingdom of Gwent was one of the first kingdoms to be formed after the Romans left and their first king was Morgan the first King Morgan the first now it's always had a very strange history Gwen because um, whereas other areas of Wales would refer to their king as a prince in Gwen he was always referred to as a king and Gwent never really, never really seen itself as Welsh or English. It was Gwent. <laughs> it was independent, an independent kingdom. I mean, it's, it kind of stems from the Republic of Siluria.
you know, just the Romans are leaving. There's a stone in Kalia Museum from Carwent, their, their capital. Carwent uh, was Isca Siluria, the market town of the Silurians in Roman terms. There's a stone there saying um, it's the Republic of Siluria. In Kalia? Yeah. In Latin? Yes. So it's a. Uh, you can see it's sort of independence. And then and that independence just carries on, like, you know. These kings of Gwent, they, they stand their own for a long time, like, you know. Eventually, eventually they come up against the Normans and the, the kings of England. It's not until the Normans get here that really starts taking Gwent apart. But then you've got characters like Yoruf of Kilian, uh, who's a descendant of the kings of Gwent. He's, he's now referred to as uh, uh, the Lord or the Prince of Kalian. But he, he fights the Normans and he fights the English king. And uh, the English king comes through here every so often with an army of 20,000 men on his way to Ireland or on his way somewhere else to give someone a kick in. And he kicks Yorif out of his castle in Kalian. Yeah? And Yorif escapes and then the king goes away and Yorif goes back there and kicks the king's men out of there and takes him back over. And then the king comes back past another time and kicks Yorif out again and then Yorif kicks his king's men out. And that goes on for a while and eventually the king sort of gets fed up with all this and decides that what he'll do is he'll make Yorif's son, Huel, a lord who has to pay homage to the king. So it's no longer got a claim to the kingdom of Gwent. And that's uh, Huel, Lord of Kilian, who gets the Cistercian monks here. We're up so into we, the 12th century. So we've just, yeah, we just got a few thorn hill. We're now still at one of the entrances into Green Meadow Wood. Is that right, yeah? Yeah, Green Meadow Wood is, is designated as a semi, semi ancient woodland. Yeah? So. If you go back on uh, the earliest maps, you can see it is a field and it's marked as coppice. So they're farming wood, but patriarchal in this field, yeah. And um, that's the earliest map reference we've got. Uh, but uh, obviously, um, we've done a lot of archaeology here, yeah? we've done um, pollen sampling of the soil, and that's told us that. Um, uh, a long time before that, there was no woods here. This was open ground. There was, in fact, there was no trees here. There was very few pollen samples of trees in the soil. Just a couple of bits of Scots pine and that was it. So this whole mountainside here was cleared of trees. Now we don't know if that was a Bronze Age people or it was just a, a quirk of nature. I su suspect it was done by the Bronze Age people because there's so much water. This whole hillside here is like a colander of springs. There's water everywhere, which hints at the, uh, an early um, water worship cult going on. Because all those springs around here are aligned with quartz conglomerate. Yeah? And of course, quartz conglomerate we is say, it. We say it aligned with it. Um, the, the, there's one in Fawn Hill Woods there. Uh, Thornhill Woods, his, his proper name is um, uh, Coid Craig Vower. I'll just get buried in. So, Green Meadow Woods and then Thornhill Woods would be where you'd walk. You'd Over by the shops there. Yes, continue, um, continue next following. To, uh, uh, below the um, community hall, <laughs> uh, Leyden Court. Yeah, yeah? Uh, that's a, it's, its old name is um, Coid Craig Vower. And uh, I'm pretty sure he went up to the top of that ridge behind you and um, down to the town centre. Yeah? Now Coid Craig Bower means Coid is forest, yeah. Craig is ridge of stone or stone, yeah, large stone or rock, and Bower is great. So it's the forest of the great ridge of stone. Right. So there, in that forest, we've got a quartz conglomerate outcrop, uh, about 10 foot across, going out, coming out of the ground at a 60 degree angle, yeah, an ancient seabed. 
and that's where you had the plates move in a long time ago. Yes. <laughs> yes. Across. Yes, the Eurasia broke up and the, and it was pushed up here, and that seabed was pushed up to that mountain there. Now, the ancient people would have easily discovered that this was an ancient seabed. Yeah, if you break it open, the conglomerate was holding the quartz together. It's all sand and shell. So you can see it's a seabed, yeah? Now, it, we've got a lot of water coming out of the mountain here, and they're lining springs with this ancient seabed rock, yeah? So it hints at the idea that there's some kind of water worship cult going on, yeah? Now, that's not unusual in the Iron Age, you know? The priesthood of the Iron Age and the Druids, yeah? They worship the elements like all ancient cultures. They worship water, fire, earth and air. And all, all modern religions are based on those four elements, you know. It's, uh, it, you cut open any good Christian and in the middle of them you'll find pagan DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Right there, Richard. Into Green Meadow Woods we go. <laughs> I like that saying. <laughs> but, um, like I said, we, we've done a lot of archaeology here. We've done a lot of trenches in this woods, on this wall. And um, we found nothing. No finds. No pot, no no coins, no anything, nothing, which is significant in itself. When you do a dig, what what would you do? What would it involve? Oh look, I think uh, eco warriors of Bran have been in your collected rubbish. <laughs> the famous red bags. <laughs> the famous red bags supplied by Keep Wheels Tidy. Sorry, what did you say? I just know, you, you said you've done quite a few digs in this wood, not find. I've not found anything. What does a dig involve? Are we going to pass a site soon? And you say, we came here for a week you. or two. I'll show you. And we did X, Y, and Z. Yes. You open trenches and you go down with a fine tough comb through the soil and you look for you look for marks in the soil. You look for a change in the in the colour of the soil, in the texture of the soil. And it tells you you're going to different levels. So here's the wall. Ah, part right. of it. Huh? So we put a trench because there's a, there was a gap here. You see, the wall runs down here and it carries on down there. Yeah? And there's a big gap here, so we thought, oh, perhaps we've got an entrance. So we put this huge trench across here. Yeah? And uh, discovered nothing. <laughs> so what, 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 but what we did discover here. Sorry? was a medieval footpath going up the side of the wall. But we don't know how old. Uh, we, it could be 500 years old, could be one and a half thousand years old, could be 2,000 years, we don't know. You can't tell with a footpath. We do know it was in a kind of medieval construction, which is like cobbles, yeah? By here, we've done a cut down the side. So, this is what the wall is built on, yeah? And we discovered that they laid clay on the ground yeah. and then they put the wall on top of the clay. Now, there's good reason for that. It's a very clever technique. But um, there's only two dangers to a wall. One is wind and the other is rain or water, yeah? Now, this wall is so substantially built that wind isn't a problem, yeah? It's described by the archaeologists as a double-flanked linear construction, which is a wall with facing blocks both sides, yeah? It's 42 inches wide everywhere, yeah? And some of the blocks in there weigh two ton. Yeah, so it, blow down. the wind's not going to blow it down, yeah? But the water can undermine it. It can seep underneath it and damage, make a hole, and the wall collapses. But this clay they're using, like all the clay in Cumbran, is waterproof. That's why they made bricks out of it, you know? And so they knew that this would make this wall permanent forever. 
you know, and then the block. It saves a small car. <laughs> Sometimes it's just one block going right across the wall. Most of it is two rows of blocks. You know, and look at this stuff. It's incredibly hard. That 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 lump of stone there is about a ton. Yeah. Now we know how they move stone. Or we think we know. They would get a team of oxen and they drag it. And two oxen can pull half a ton. So if you want to pull a ton, you need four oxen. Yeah? Now four oxen can only work for four or five hours a day. Otherwise you kill them. Yeah? <laughs> so if you're going to use oxen to build this wall, you're going to need a team of oh, uh, six, twelve oxen, you know, and uh, they're going to have to work in shifts, yeah. And then you need maybe oh, 50, 60 men, yeah, and they're going to have to work in, you know, every day, because we found in this woods is 326 meters of this stuff, yeah. And we estimated the, the weight of stone, and there's more stone than Stonehenge. You know, this is a big, major construction job, yeah? And that's just what's left in this woods. Like I said earlier, we're pretty sure it goes a mile down the valley, like, you know? Mm. Or half a mile down the valley, down to Tea Cork. Well, that's massive. You're talking huge amount of wealth. To be able to build it, just get the oxen, the men. The, just, yeah, well, yeah, all the that average stuff. farm at the time would um, share a team of oxen. They use oxen for ploughing, yeah, and there'd be half a dozen farms, and they'd have one pair of oxen between them, because they only use them for ploughing really and pulling out the old tree stumps. So most of the year they weren't doing anything, but you had to feed them. So these are expensive creatures to keep, like, you know. So the farmers would share a pair of them, you know, between them, and they'd all contribute to their upkeep, you know, and all use them when they needed to. So someone had some serious money, mm. because not only did they have to, uh, not only did they have to gather up oxen from the whole area, yeah, because, like I said, one, six farms, one pair of oxen, well, you need 12 oxen, really, or more you know so you're talking about a massive area or, or a, a load of wealth to be able to buy them yeah and then you need well, I don't know 10 20 30 40 50 men working on you constantly all of those men have to be fed and their families have to be fed that's another huge outlay of money you know and how long did it take them did it take them a year did it take them six months you know it's got to have taken them a year, isn't it? At least. Now, so all that time, these people are not farming. They're, not, they're subsistent farmers. They feed themselves from their own farming. Someone's paying them. Someone's looking after them and, and their families. You know? Now, who is in a position to do that? Who's got the money to do that? This has got to be either a, a religion or a king. Yeah? Now we've put, we've got a preliminary date for these walls. We've we've done this 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 really sophisticated testing. Yeah, I'll tell you about it. Let's walk up the wall a little. It runs all the way up through here. I think there's been millions of metal detectors here, but they're never going to find anything. Oops, we didn't find anything, and we've done loads of archaeology. And then you, with archaeology, you find stuff because, you, like I said, you go down through the soil with a fine tough point. It's all buried, but uh, it's all there. The wall, the wall's in there. End of the. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. Pops up again. Pops up again. One tree on it. It's uh, quite a nice spot. To see. You can see. You can see more of its construction here. Yeah? Come a little bit further. Uh, nice little tree growing on it. It's been there a year or two. <laughs> what is it? An oak? Oh, 
got to be about 60, 70 years old, I know. Yeah. Oh, yes. Wow. Now, you can see here how it faced both sides. So they cut the stone so it's got a nice smooth edge, both sides. Yeah. You mentioned the statue about, about the, the, the difficulty in cutting or carving, the difficulty in cutting this stuff must be. It's really, kind of really problem. hard. But they could do it. This is not a natural, yeah, it's not a natural. That's not a natural no. shape. No. You know? And it's not, uh, it's, it hasn't been rolled around by a glacier because it have rounded edges. So it's been cut. So they've taken it off the, the, the outcrop up there and cut it. They probably found some of it down here as well. There is bits of this scattered all over Cumbran. There's a massive amount down at Lantalum Abbey. But that's probably another story. But uh, you can see the width of it here. Yeah? We measured it everywhere. And about 42 inches, almost exactly 42 inches everywhere. Yeah. Which is a strange measurement in itself. We're, we're not quite sure how that works out and whether it's a, a, an, an early Christian yard or something. So we were, there's a, there's a new technique well, it's not new, but it's, it's only recently been perfected, right? It's called something like, um, oh, I can never get this right. It's a technical term. Um, oscillating luminescence, something, stimulation, something like that, right? So um, I think they refer to it as OSL, yeah? And um, the, the, the archaeologists and the geologists have come up with a way of dating when a stone was placed on the ground. Which is madness, isn't it? Uh, look at that little robin. Oh bless, little robin there. You Can you see it? Yes, boop. Listen to your nice, talk. Nice symbol of wealth in, in, in Celtic mythology. <laughs> um, is it really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well it depends what book you read. <laughs> but, uh, to me it's a nice symbol of wealth. Hello little robin. Yeah. Um, which is nice because I went for a job interview today. <laughs> uh, yeah, so where was I? I lost my thread. I thought it was the, um, the, um, width, the width, the right. width, so width, the width, the width, 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 and then, then this, the, this no, no, OSL is the, yeah. the method of this has been discovered yeah, right. or coming so out. So what they do is um, there's there's a background radiation in the world, yeah, and they can measure. Uh, the effect on that background radiation in the soil underneath a, a wall. Because uh, once, once the soil is covered, it affects the background radiation in the quartz of the soil and it jumps. And it stays jumped until they uncover it and test it. Yeah? And then it jumps back and they can measure that jump and then they can get a date from that. Right, well, we've done that here. Yeah? We, um, we've done some preliminary tests. There was this guy called um, uh, uh, Dr. Tim Kennard, who was a famous, uh, well, television famous geologist who done uh, done similar testing for the blue stones of Stonehenge to date when they were put there. Yeah, yeah? there's a recent television program about it, and um, he's done some testing for us here. We done a preliminary test and we sent it to him. Yeah of soil and he came up with a rough date yeah and then he done some more testing which are more detailed and we'll have the results for them in about three months time but the preliminary testing came up with a date between the first and the third century AD this wall this wall yeah <laughs> was built 200 years after the birth of Christ the Romans were still in Kalia when it was built but this is no Roman war. No. The Romans didn't build like this. So we're talking 1800 years ago. Roughly. It could have been 1700 years ago. It could have been 1900 years ago. But it was a bloody long time ago. Which feeds into why we didn't find anything. Because people didn't have pockets <laughs> and they didn't carry stuff around I mean the, the the consensus was this was always some kind of Cistercian Grange wall you know that the monks of Lantarm had built somewhere about seven eight hundred years ago yeah 
But the monks, they, their workers were lay brothers. Well, these were just locals, you know, who worked for their food and their, their, their home. They were, they were kind of slaves, really. But, it, you know, if you were starving to death, it was better than nothing, wasn't it? Well, they, they, would have, they would have had all sorts of things on them, you know. They would have uh, carried food around with them and they would have had jugs of cider Drop, and yeah. all sorts. And they would have dropped something. You know, there would be some evidence here. It's nothing, nothing. It's clean as a whistle, everywhere, everywhere. So in a few months, the ONR, what's it called? O, o OSL. OSL. Uh, hang on. Uh, oscillating stimul, oscillating stimulescence, luminescence, something like that. There, OSL. Degrees a bit more information on whether, you know, that sort of 200, yeah, well, it's going to tell us whether yeah. that date is accurate or not. What does that make you feel like? Stuff like that, you know, just... Well, amazing, <laughs> because I, I've, been, I've been working on this site for 10 years. And we, we... It's just a total mystery. And it blows the mind of anyone who tries to work it out, like, you know. Because not only have you got this wall in this woods, but you've got two Bronze Age cairns you got standing stones, you've got a walled well, a ritual walled well, you know? And, and, and they're all, they're all n right next to each other. Now we know the Bronze Age cairns are about three and a half thousand years old, yeah? And we've got no idea how old the walled well is, and we've got no idea how old this is. So we, we presumed that this was much younger than the, than the cairns, yeah? But um, to, to think that it's like just in the edge of the Iron Age and the Cairns are in the Bronze Age, yeah? And then you've got the Christian site up there of Clan Durbel, which is only th two, three fields away from us by here, man, yeah? And then you've got this pilgrim site right by here, yeah? Well then, maybe you're looking at religious activity from three and a half thousand years up until the 1500s mm. when e old Henry VIII came along and smashed all the <laughs> monasteries like you know I, and robbed them of all their money <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to get a bend that's a crack little view Don't mind. Right, should we go and have a look yeah. at a bit more it keeps going up cheers Oops. It's a beautiful woodland this as well. It is. It is stunning. The diversity of wildflowers. Everything you could think of is here. You know, and um, there's, a, there's a lot of a uh, lot of lot of talk about, uh, or there's been a lot of science about the energy that comes off quartz. Well, they, they use it for running watches, don't they? And all sorts of things. And um, I've noticed over the years that the bluebells grow much better next to a lump of this than they do away from them. Wow. <laughs> now, we dug, we dug here, we put a huge trench across there, went down, big gang of volunteers, cut this sort of two metre wide, four metre long trench from sort of there, going right into there, yeah? Because we were looking for the corner, because we know the wall's running that way now. Ah, right, yeah. They come up here, and then they run that way. So we thought, well, this could be a corner. Find a corner, you might find something in the corner. Mm. You know, someone might have buried something there once upon a time. It's a good spot now. So we dug all around there, no corner, no wall. Here, right? Now we knew it would come up here, and then the wall disappears just down there, sort of disappears into the ground, right, you know? So we're digging here, thinking, right, the wall there, wall there, there to be a corner there, I think there, no stone. So we cut the trench that way, and we carried on, right? And we went across, and we did it on. <laughs> we got to about there, and we hit the wall. Right? 
So then we went that way a little bit and we discovered the wall comes straight up here and then it curves, this huge curve from around here, which tells you something else, see, because Romans didn't build in curves, they built in squares. Now who built in curves? Well, that was the Iron Age people around here with their roundhouses. Yeah, so possibly it's older. Yeah. It's older. Mind you, that didn't deter most of the experts. Most of them thought, no, no, it's still Cistercian. It's still, it's still medieval. That's how people can build them. <laughs> There's the wall. It's still running across there. You see it there? On the ground? Yeah? Yeah. Just in there, there's a group of about seven large stones. No, that's, a, that's, a, no, that's a, a tree trunk. They're sort of buried in the ground, but there's, it's a strange, like, little spiral of stones. But the wall runs along here. There you go. That oak tree is sitting on top of it. <laughs> yeah. And then, it came to... Where did we get to? We got to, to there. See these stones? Yeah? yeah. And it stops. No wall there. Which was really strange. <laughs> we couldn't work that one out for a while. That took us a few years to work out what happened to the wall. And then we've done a dig over there. Across to that gap there. And we discovered that the wall actually bends up a little bit here. More okay. caves. And there's a slight dog leg of it. And then it comes through here. And this is it here. You see a few stones. But there's something else here as well, which is really interesting. There's a spring, an ancient spring bed running straight down through here. And the wall, right? <laughs> it comes straight through the side of the wall. And then where it hit the wall, there was a piece of this quartz conglomerate, which is still underground there, right? That was this shaped, like a little tiny bridge. And the water was channeled through the wall. And down there, yeah? And then it bends and it drops down into that ravine. And down in the bottom of that ravine is a three metre square walled well. From there? Bronze Age. We don't know. We've yet to find out. Sorry, it was the other at the, at the sites in this woods. You mentioned yeah, the, um... the Bronze Age. Yeah. Let's go and see the Bronze Age. Shall we? <laughs> so the wall runs across here. Yeah. Somehow it cuts across here. And then it runs on the top of the span. See it? See bits of it? Most of it's been pushed over. But well, we've done trenches here, then you can oh, yeah. easily establish it in the ground here. There's a lot of it down there. Down there is the walled well. It's all overgrown now, you can't see it. But it was a square walled area that was about, about uh, a metre high. Yeah, Big blocks of stone, big massive blocks of stone. And then out of the centre of it, we dug it, there's three little springs bubbling out of the ground and then also that spring being fed into it the one around the wall yeah, yeah the one that goes under the wall being fed down into it down the bank loads of stone coming down the bank as if it was channeling a stream yeah and possibly another spring over there feeding into it so then you've got five springs yeah and it fills up this square of walling about a meter deep three meters square now, what's that for? Yeah? It's down in a ravine. It's no good for cattle. Of course, you yeah, you yeah. don't send animals down a ravine to water. It was walled all the way around. No good for animals. They, <laughs> you just let it bubble out of the ground, wouldn't you, when they would drink from the ground? Yeah. yeah? And being down in a ravine, no good for animals. Yeah? No good for humans. It's three metres square. You can't cover it. You have to cover drinking water for humans, otherwise dead birds and things fall in it. So it's not a human drinking well. So what is it? No idea. 
back to that kind of you mentioned about the the, the, the religious aspects of you know little... now it's for there isn't it yeah now we know the wall is possibly early christian but that's down by there right and we know that is three and a half thousand years old here so where are we getting now what's the what's the Hang screen on. Sorry. see this bank running across here it runs across here and then it goes just over there and it does a right turn right we'll walk over the bank on yeah, the top of point out. yeah and you get onto a plateau a flat plateau that's running for about 30 foot that way see yeah yeah we're above it Oops. and then there's another bank going across there and there's another plateau can you see that it's difficult to see if i know yeah so we, get, we had this plateau yeah with these big lumps of quartz see that lump of quartz there and then there's another lump in the trees over by there and there's another one 15 meters that way and then there's another one a bit further on and then another one there's about eight of them it was surrounding us in this huge oval yeah so we had this plateau so we were doing digs here so we were trying to work out well, what's this flat area with all this stone maybe it's a building maybe someone had a house here a long time ago so we cut a trench here I cut the trench here actually cut a little trench here yeah and we didn't find anything in the trench except a little half where there was a fire which is a bit strange like you know so you know, like so you can put a couple of stones around it and made a fire so in the bottom of that little half there was a lump of charcoal so oh, we're going to date that are we yeah because we're down a, we're down a good foot or so then so I sent this lump of charcoal off to Cardiff University. This is in the early project, the uh, ancient Cumbran and Cistercians project. And they come back with a date of uh, somewhere around 16, 1700. Yeah? So someone had a fire year around the time of the Lords of Lord Hanbury and all them. You know, they were around that land, uh, this land by then. And um, so that didn't really tell us anything. In the well, we didn't find anything at all, no finds at all, except a musket ball, which dated around the same time. But that musket ball had been fired up into the air and landed in water, because we could tell by it hadn't hit anything. <laughs> so we thought maybe the musket ball and the fire got something to do with each other, but we couldn't find out anything further than that. And then some years later, after the project was finished and the ancient Cumbrian Society was formed and we decided to do some more digs in the woods, we come back to this site and we tracked, we got back to the fire pit yeah, and come across here and realised that the soil going this way was different. The soil there and there is different to the soil by here. Different what? Different when you examined it, when you dug down, when you... Yeah, when you dug down and you looked at the a profile of it, you could see that it had been cut. Some, in some time in the past, someone had cut a trench across here. Yeah? So we thought, well, what's, where's the trench going? What's that about? So we followed the trench. We got into the centre where you're standing and we found a kist. A Bronze Age kiss, which is an arrangement of stones into a square, and in the centre of it, they would have put a little earthenware jar and a pile of ashes of their ancestors. Yeah, no, there was no jar, there was no ashes, but there was a cut that happened in the 1700s. So we figured someone Fire. robbed it out. Someone, so probably Lord Hanbury or one of these descendants come up here, a couple of navvies, had a cup of tea, a little fire go in, and employed the navvies to dig into the centre of the mound and got himself something for his mantelpiece, didn't he? Yeah? So, now we know this was a Bronze Age mound. 
So then we could work out the dimensions. So what we've done is we quartered it and we dug a whole area, massive area here, and we went down. It's the biggest dig in the woods? Our biggest trench. Yeah. Biggest trench, yes. Sorry. Biggest trench. Yeah. Big triangle, a quarter of the whole mound. And we went down, we went down, and uh, and we didn't find anything. Well, when I say we didn't find it, we didn't find any finds. But what we did find was how they constructed the mound. Yeah. Kiss is in the centre, like I said. We got nice photographs of it. And there's even a, on our website, the Ancient Cumbrian Society, there is an archaeological report for this dig, Green Meadow Woods, yeah. And uh, then we discovered that there's possibly a, a satellite burial in there. They, they, they might have stuck some ashes in there later. Because these are, these are family plots, like, mm. you know. And we believe there was, it was about, twi about from those little trees there, there, to about over here, a huge mound of stone, probably about 15 foot up, yeah, and probably about 20 foot across, an oval in shape, yeah. Now, there's this one here, and we discovered another one just over there on the next plateau. So that makes it a Bronze Age cemetery because there's more than one burial, yeah? There's marker stones all the way around it. So this is a, a major Bronze Age sacred site. We also discovered that they put a line of coloured sand around the mound, which is remarkable in itself, isn't it? Because they would have kept the mound clean, wouldn't they? Because it's a burial site. So there would have been rituals and, I don't know, whatever their rituals were, penned into the dead but this wouldn't have been done for any joe blocks this was uh, an important family plot you know at least at least a local uh, lord or local ruler in the bronze age talking one and a half thousand bc three and a half thousand years ago you know same time as the bronze age cairns were built up around tumbala now you might ask yourself like because Bronze Age cairns are mainly up on mountains. Right, I said, what are they doing here? They're a bit low down, isn't they? Because you're only about 600 feet above sea level, yeah? yeah? yeah. But Bronze Age cairns almost always look at the sea. Yeah? They've got this affinity with the sea, yeah? Water. So you're back into this water worship thing, yeah? And you've got this quartz conglomerate, which is seabed again, yeah? Now, if you stood here before they built the Masaru estate, yeah. yeah, which is just by there. In fact, if you come up by here, you might be able to see some of the houses. Uh, maybe not. You take my word for it. It's a hundred yards that way. Yeah. yeah, and you're on the back gardens of the Masaru, right? Before they built those houses, if you looked in that direction, you were looking at those two islands in the Severn. You could see right across, because the land drops away, all the way across. And you can see it if you if you uh, go up to Penmice Road, just up there, you can see all the way down to the Severn, can't you? Well, you've got the same view here, but of course, once, it, once the woods grew up, there's trees blocking your view, but then they, also they put those houses just on the top of the land there, just enough to block your view of the seven. But uh, I've been in the bedrooms of those houses and looked across, and you can see it, you know, you can see the seven. In the eye line of, yeah. So in the eye line of these Bronze Age camp, which is really important to the Bronze Age people. Mm. I, I, nobody really knows why, but um, we also noticed that. This ancient seabed's important to them. <laughs> yeah? And, and they're, they're, they're quite interesting. Let's, let's, let's have a little walk around this bronze age cemetery, is okay? The whole of the bank is revetted. We're gonna... So the whole bank is what, sorry? Revetted, which means they laid stones against the bank to hold it up, yeah? So like big slabs of stone are laid all the way across there. If you walk on there, you'll see, you'll feel them underfoot, like you know. Yeah. So they've done that all the way around here. 
all the way across and they also done you can see there you are there's some see those stones lying on the bank there yeah that's them revetting the bank yeah oh those yeah just there yeah well we're gonna we're gonna date them we couldn't get a date off the cairn with that osl we couldn't get a date off the cairn because of the way they built it they they they, they cut the ground and leveled it as far as we can tell and then built the cairn later so we had there wasn't that there's nothing, the dated, science, yeah. nothing datable like you know but uh, maybe we might get one some date off the revetted stone because they laid them at a particular time but uh, anyway so we round the edge of the bronze age cairn yeah look at this right here, right here. Covered in two bags, but uh, seen in glass. And another huge block of quartz conglomerate. That's about 15 meters from the last one we looked at, yeah. And I remember we we're going round ovals, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, the curves are. So let's go up here. And in the infinite wisdom of the Development Corporation, they built a footpath through this Bronze Age cemetery. <laughs> This is the path that links Thornhill to the Mike Shoe, isn't it? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. And Mono Court is just there on the left. Look at this one. It's one of the biggest stones in the woods. We estimate about two ton in weight. Yeah. yeah. Looks like it's been pushed over. It might have been a standing stone once upon a time. It might have been upright. And then we got a bit more here. All sorts of bits of stone lying around here. That's where the spring bed comes, the stream comes out. And so there. And we think of where that tree is, it's the centre of the other Bronze Age head. Now all the stone on top, remember I said this, like uh, they would be 15 foot high and about 20 foot across. So there's a massive amount of stone in there. Mm. Masses of this stuff. Well, I got an eyewitness account of the sister of the farmer who lived in the farm there in Thornhill of him taking large amounts of stone out of this woods to revet a whole field next to his house. And you go up there to that, I think it's Park Farm up there, you can see tons oh, we see, and tons we see it from Penmice Road, the um, sort of farm building in the Thornhill. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's yeah, the farm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I talked to his sister, who was very elderly. That was back in 2000, I think. And she said, uh, yeah, my brother took loads of stone out of the woods. To and she showed me, it's like, it's holding a whole field back by the side of their house, like, you know. And then, if you go to Green Meadow Farm, yeah, the, all the buildings are made out of this stuff. And if you go to Penlang Gwyn Farm, all the buildings are made out of this stuff. So, all, so pen, 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 farmers were robbing this, this site for years and years. Of which, they, of course, they would. It's on their land. They, they're just utilising stone that's lying around on their land, you know? Yeah. If they needed to build something, they'd use it, wouldn't they? So that's why there isn't these huge mounds of stone here. He's been taking but the, the kiss is still here. Yeah. So we know the cairns were there. More big blocks down here. Another nice one here, right? Ah. Remember, repeat the um, so half hour you mentioned the um, the, the Stonehenge kind of stat you worked out. Yeah, <laughs> it's massive, isn't it? Well, think Which about it, right? You've got a, a, a just over a meter wide of stone, yeah, and uh, what's left of it? I mean, we don't know how tall this wall was because obviously. There's been a lot of robbing of stone. Maybe it was just like that. Maybe it's because this ritual is just a low wall of big blocks, you know. But um, we, so we got no idea how tall it was. But we do know there's 326 meters of it left, and it's over a meter wide. So that's you know, 326 square meters, or more than square meters. That's a that's that's big. 
that's a lot of stone you know so that's why i say oh, it's more stone than stone edge <laughs> it's 326 square meters of stone is is a big lump of stone isn't it yeah. Huge, yeah. yeah, it's huge. <laughs> it's mind-boggling, really. But then think about it, right? That's what's just in the woods. Remember, I said there's good evidence of this running all the way down to Teacock. Mm. So then, how much stone are you talking about then? And and it, if you go down by um, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, Camrose Camrose Walk, you know miles. where the banana bridge goes over behind the tamarind. But well, don't, yeah. Yeah, Camrose, and then yeah. That, that, those houses in there, is that called Camrose Walk? Yeah, so, yeah. St. Dyle's. One of the streets, yeah. If you walk down through the path there, just on the left, there's like four or five massive blocks of stone <laughs> sitting on the end of a house next to what was another ancient lane going across there because you can still see the hedgerow just opposite it, you know? So it's the same scenario, scenario as uh, by Tesco's Express. You've got a lane going across where the wall run and there's these huge blocks of stone. Mm. Probably it may be disturbed by the builders of the lane, we don't know. Or maybe marking the conjunction mm. of a wall and the lane. Mm. That's interesting stuff. Yeah. Fascinating, isn't it? One thing you mentioned a few times is things like um I mentioned the um squared sort of water well down there, the burial site. And you had to solve it. When you find these things out, you're a bit of like detective, isn't it? You're like, so yes. when, you're, when you're looking at a water and you're thinking, why would that be for animals? It's too steep for animals. Yeah. Why would we for humans? It's too big, too big to cover. Yeah. Is it kind of like a sort of detective game of. Well, yeah. You're, just, you're, you're looking at a mystery yeah. and you're trying to work out what, what, what the constructions. I mean, we, we never found anything in here, but as, as one professor said to me, he said, Rich, you found loads. You might not have found any finds, but you found building, mm. which is much more important than finds, isn't it? Mm. You know, because someone took a lot of a find, well, anybody can lose something, can't they? Like <laughs> an arrowhead or something like that, or, or, a, or a gold bracelet or a ring, or, you know, you, you can find that sort of stuff. But this is, this is major construction. This is a lot of work, you know, and someone had a lot of money to pay for it. You know, or a, or or there's some kind of religious dedication going on, and that's why I always lean to it being some kind of religious site, just because of the work involved. Well, why would anybody put? And, you know, all right, build a wall. Yeah, if you need to build a wall, build a wall. And walls can be for lots of things. They're usually boundaries, or for protection, or something like that. Yeah. All right, so build a boundary wall. This could be a boundary wall. Why would you face it both sides? Why why are you making a wall look pretty on both sides if it's just for a boundary of a farm? That that's why take the trouble to make it that aesthetically pleasing unless it's got some other purpose than being just a boundary. And that's why I've always leaned to the idea that there's something spiritual, religious going on. Because when you start employing art into construction, it's usually got some significance. This construction's more than just practical, isn't it? Mm. Like Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel, you know? They didn't, they didn't paint everyone's house, did they? <laughs> but yeah, so Combined to Sistine me, Chapel. <laughs> it's always been, it's always been a, a, some kind of sacred site. And it would tie in. We got um, Clan Derville just up there, you know, and uh, you've got the pilgrim roots of Lantanum Abbey. We know the Lantanum Abbey were making a lot of money by bringing pilgrims up here. Maybe the pool down there is a baptism pool. Maybe it does date from the early Christian. Maybe, maybe it's maybe the Cistercians put it there, you know. To, stick sinners' heads under the water, like, you know, before they got up to the, the chapel up there, you know, pay homage to St. Derval. And St. Derval's massive in Welsh history because um, later on, I mean, you've got these poems about him being one of King Arthur's knights, you know, and, and, and like all of Welsh heritage or history, 
art was Welsh, you know. It doesn't matter what English heritage say about Tintagel or any other site. As far as all the Welsh poets are concerned, Arthur's Welsh. And, and Arthur is probably a, an early British word meaning the bear that's a prince or the prince that's a bear. Arthur Thur is, is a name for a minor prince. Like Tudor, it comes from the same root, you know. Tudor means a minor prince, yeah. Uh, but it had obviously been anglicised, the word. It didn't quite sound like Tudor in the original. I think it sounds more like Tutha, you know? But um, anyway, so you've got all this Arthur stuff wrapped around St. Dervo and and Cleon. And let's be fair, this, we're in Cleon, aren't we? And, uh, and we're building a major Christian site on the edge of Cleon. Yeah? So you have Dervil up there, Cleon, and then Later on, after they come and smash all the monasteries, King Henry decides he's going to change the religion in Britain, doesn't he? And he's going to make um, uh, the Church of England, yeah? And he's kicking the Catholics out, isn't he? Yeah? Now, of course, by now, old Derville up there is classed as a Catholic, isn't it? Even if he was before the, even if he was 6th century, way before the Catholics ever got to Wales, you know, when you had the early British Celtic Church, some people call it, Western British Church, other people call it, which is much older than Catholicism, you know, and he was in Britain a long time before the Catholics got here. Even if he was from that church, which is a kind of Druidic Christian church, he was by 1500 classed as a Catholic saint yeah and the people loved him and he was popular right across Wales and there is another clan Derville church in North Wales and Derville in, in, in Welsh history becomes the Bishop of Bardsley the island of 20,000 saints you know he become, he's a big figure in, in Welsh um, Christian history so Henry VIII comes along smashes all the monastery, kicks all the Catholics out, yeah? And then he has a, a bit of a problem because the Welsh, being very Catholic and being very much loyal to the, to the um, uh, Catholic faith, yeah, don't want to become Church of England and they don't want to speak English in their church and they they want to stick to their old ways. So they carry on worship in their local saints. And um, one of the uh, Henry VIII's bishops, I think his name was uh, Latimer or Latimore, yeah, wrote that um, the Welsh worship gargoyle images of saints. Yeah. So when, um, when Henry VIII decides to do all this and at the same time I think he wants to um, uh, divorce his wife Catherine of Aragon I think it is and uh, and she has a confessor monk who's a Catholic yeah, called Forrest and he refuses to accept the king as the supreme head of the church because he's loyal to the Pope Latimer decides to burn him <laughs> I mean so they felt that they'll have a they'll have a football match in in Smithfield in London because they used to do this regular yeah and they would hang someone or burn someone or, or, or <laughs> quarter them or something to entertain the people, the day. Right? and they used to stick posters up you know they used to stick these posters up advertising the the, the weekend event of burning a witch or killing a Catholic or something yeah and they put a poster up in um, Hall's Chronicles I think it's recorded. And it, it said something like, um, uh, well, it referred to St. Dervil, but the reason it referred to St. Dervil was when they decided to kill this friar of forest, yeah, Latimer decided to get a statue of St. Dervil from Wales, take it up to London and burn that with forest strapped to it as a kind of symbol to the Welsh that, look, this old religion is ended and you're not allowed to worship these saints anymore because they're Catholic. So they took the, the statue up there, yeah. The locals have tried to bribe 
um, the, the king's men with a massive amount of money not to take their statue, but they took it anyway. We think they took it from the church in North Wales, yeah, because there's a remnant of a statue left up there, which is a stag that's laid across its feet. But this Hall's Chronicles recorded what the statue looked like. It said that it was uh, Saint Derval, a warrior in his armour with his shield and spear. Yeah? And they, and they took it to London and this Hall's Chronicle noted that Forrest, the friar, that obstinate liar who won't accept the king as the supreme head must die in his fire, you know? And so they strap him to the statue of St. Derval and slowly roast him to death in Smithfield while they preach the gospel at him. And so they kill two birds with one stone. Send a very strong, incredible message. Yeah, sending a message to the Welsh. And that's all tied into this area. It's beautiful, isn't it? Incredible. <laughs> Oh, there you are. Thank you. If you go up the St. there's a there's a um, there's an interpretation board up there with the uh, with that uh, poem on it. You know, I wish I could recite it clearly. <laughs> to you, but I, I can't remember it clearly. Forest. There, there was a there was a legend apparently in Wales that the statue of St. Derval, if it ever burned down, it would burn down a forest. And they ended up roasting a, forest, a friar <laughs> called Forest in, in London, in Smithfields. So, what do you think? Incredible, yeah. Incredible? Or loop around, yeah. Should we uh, finish it there, you think? Sure, Anything yeah, else you want to know? Let's walk back to the edge of the woods. Let's get, let's, let's get us back into there. Okay. Well, uh, we can't, it's a shame we can't see the... the um, well down there, but that spring run across here, let's see, you can see the dip in the land, and there's a stone, and the stone lines all the way down into there. When, when we came here to dig it in 2008, I think it was, that was all clear, believe it or not. That's overgrown since. It's a, it's, it's a strange phenomenon, the wood. You know, some areas become clear and then they grow over. But there was there was a beech tree growing up through there, so it was blocking the light for a lot of the ground. So it was all oh, nice and man. clear. But now, the, well, there was also a burnt out car in there as well. <laughs> we had to get a burnt out car out first. But is it the date, a burnt out car? Yeah, well, it was somewhere around the 1970s. <laughs> So, someone's asked, where, where, where is St. Derval in North Wales? St. Derval in North Wales, um, oh, up by, not far from Harlech, that area. Uh, what's that slate mine place? Fistiliog. Blyna Fistiliog. Blyna Fistiliog. It's on the road between Blyna Fistiliog and uh, uh, what's the famous Maddock? Um, Porth Maddock. Porth Maddock. In between those Italian sort of style. Italian? Oh no, Porth Maddock. I was thinking Port Merion, sorry. Yeah, no. Porth Maddock, Porth Maddock, sorry. Blind for Stenyog and Porth Maddock. Do you know who, Porth, who Maddock was? No. Maddock was. Um, in legend, Maddock went to America in the 6th yeah. century and stayed there. He took, his, he took a whole bunch of people with him. And they, they lived with the Mandam Indian tribe. And um, an army captain in the early part of the American colonies recorded um, these, these American Indians with, a, with a, a white flash in their... The women had a white flash in their hair and they, um, they had... Uh, 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 memories of, of Welsh people and they could speak Welsh and there was um, later on um, some local historians from this area went over to the Kentucky area of America and um, 
got a certificates of the of the NAIR or whatever it is of Kentucky for their historical research. They found they found um, uh, an Iron Age fort there. So they reckon uh, there's a river going up to Kentucky. I forget what it's the river system there. But apparently they, they went over there and they went up the river and, and they settled by these Indians called the Mandram or Mandram. They brought over some of the things they were doing in the UK, in the UK or the, was it Portmatic you mentioned? Pardon? Some of the things in starting sort of Portmatic they took to. Port Maddock is, is the port of Maddock, it's yeah. named after him. But, and that's uh, who went to America. Yeah, he was some kind of um, some kind of king or some kind of prince. But he disappeared after America. But the beauty of it, it's about a thousand years before Columbus went there. But everybody knows, I mean, anyone with any sense knows that Columbus didn't discover America. You know, there was people go. You imagine the Vikings were there, everyone was there, weren't they? People were, were sailing around the world in ships thousands of years before Columbus came around. You know, it's, 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 it's silly to think Columbus went there. In fact, there is, there's, a, there's a bit of evidence that Columbus was guided there from a, 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 a sailor from Britain. And, uh, that area of Britain at the time was called uh, Amamathia, I think, and maybe that's why the place is called America, because it's named after Amamathia. <laughs> and that's the guy who got in there. I mean, um, you'd have to have some evidence to get the, the Queen of Portugal, was it, to invest a couple of well, what would it be equivalent to now? A, a couple of million quid in an expedition? Mm. She'd want to know. She'd want to know why you thought there was a big continent over there, wouldn't she? <laughs> and how much money she's going to make out of it before she gives you a couple of ships? And the easy one to bump into, the size of it. Yeah. So, do you think like it? You know, I'm sure incredible passion. Incredible passion for, for history generally. I mean, just nowadays, you know, I know, I'm, I know, the amount of detective skills you've spoke about today, and nothing to do with Google, it's just to do with a bit of knowledge and a bit of, you know, things like, you know, the, the religious sites and, you know, sighted lines to, to the water. And it must be fascinating to, like, mix that with what, you know, documents and, you know, like, being able to well, they're, research they're, stuff that... They're interests of mine, you know? Yeah. I've, I've always been interested in um, um, spirituality and, um, and belief systems. And I've read... I've read um, every religion, every belief system there is in the world. All the major ones I know, I know well, you know. So, so, uh, and then on top of that, I grew up in Cumbran on the Bywiz estate in the Twinings, you know. Uh, we moved in here in the 1960s and I, they, I watched them build it up around here. And maybe because I had a mother who was from another country and, you know, I, I developed a, a, an interest in in the local history, and because it was a new town, nobody knew anything, and nobody knew anything about the place, you know. So I started talking to old farmers, and you know, and started trying to get an idea of what what they knew about the area, and and then of course you get drawn to Killian, because all roads lead to Killian, don't they? Because it's ancient. <coughs> And I met a few people in Killian. I had a, a, a gallery, I'm an artist and I, so I had a small studio gallery in Killian for a while in a place called the Furham. And it was run by a Dr. Uh, Russell Rees. And Dr. Russell Rees was, well, he was, he was uh, mad about Welsh culture. And he, he built the Furham and put all the statues in there that are wrapped around the stories of the Mabinogai, yeah, you know? to inject some Welsh culture into this Welsh cultural desert, which is, <laughs> which is the industrial part of, of Wales, Gwen, you know? So, um, yeah, so I got even more interested then after befriending Russell Rees and him telling me stuff. And, and he was a big, big enthusiast of the idea of King Arthur being in Killian. 
and, and rightly so. I mean, the Mabinogi, um, uh, the stories of the Mabinogi on and all that, uh, they place Arthur in Caleon, you know, and all, in, if you read this, the Mabinogi, yeah, it's not just Arthur that's in Caleon. Caleon is the most mentioned town in all the stories of the Mabinogi. And the, all those, those stories are our most ancient oral tradition from Wales, you know, so you can't sort of, you can't, you can't poo-hoo someone who says, well, I think Arthur's from Cleon. Well, one of the stories in the, in the Mabinogion starts, um, uh, Arthur was holding court in Cleon on Usk at Whitson. It was his tradition to do this. <laughs> what do you want? Yeah. What sort of evidence do you want? Like you know, this. I mean, do you think someone sort of made that up, or you know? And these these old stories, they're not they're not um, they're not fables that someone made up. They are recorded history that was brought down through an oral tradition. You know, so yeah, so I got interested in that, and then, like I said, my interest in spirituality and. I teach meditation, you know, and, and, and uh, I thought when I found, found this site and realised the significance of the site up there, the Durval, and I had a look at that, and I sort of grew up with knowing these places, but without really attaching any historical significance to them. I decided we'll have a we'll have a closer look. So I sort of um, uh, at first I was sort of thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't say anything about them. Maybe I'll just keep quiet about them, because if I start telling people about them, they're going to start coming, dig them up and mess around with them. And, and I used to sit in these woods and meditate you know, by year actually. I used, to, I used to spend a lot of time meditating just around the corner by here. And I used to think, well, there's something special about this place. This has got a special vibe, like, you know. And, uh, and, then, and then Mike Price, who lives just over there, who was part of Cumbran Historical Society, started um, badgering uh, Bob Wellington about the balls in the woods. Are they going to do something about them? Are they ancient? What are they? And and um, Bob didn't really have an answer. He tried he tried to bring an, uh, an archaeologist up here to have a look, and um, and he didn't really give him any information. And so someone told Bob that there was some mad artist living just down by there <laughs> who who knew a lot about the history of the place. And, uh, and I'd done some research on it. So Bob turned up in my door one day, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and uh, he um, encouraged me to um, put a, a, a PowerPoint thing together, you know? And, and to, so he could take me round other councillors and start showing them what was here, you know? Yeah. And, and, and what potential it had, because Bob was very much into the idea of putting Cumran on the map, you know, tourism and all that. And um, and fair play, he 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 really he really tried. I mean, he got a um, heritage status for Blenavon, didn't he? But um, he was looking for something uh, significant in Cumran as well. So we put this PowerPoint presentation together, and then he got me to present it to. The heritage lottery people and then with, with the help of uh, neighborhood services and and the heritage officer we put a bid into the lottery and they gave us um, 48 grand to run a, a project i wrote the project i wrote what we was going to do like you know i had five archaeological sites and then i described the historical research we would do um, a bit of medieval farming and a bit of art. We produced a, a statue of St. Derville, didn't we? Which is over in Fawn Hill Community Centre. And um, 
and yeah and off went the project went and uh, we had uh, I went on the radio a couple of times with a Welsh BBC Wales and described the project and we gathered up volunteers and we had 150 volunteers it was the biggest participation yeah. project that Torvine had ever had and then mind Torvine <laughs> anyone had had anywhere like they couldn't believe it the council they were stunned you know the amount of interest in it was massive and maybe because it was a new town like you know and, yeah. and people didn't know very much about the area yeah. so we had uh, we done digs we run the project for 18 months you know but obviously come to the end of the money and then uh, we decided well, I had all these volunteers who still wanted to carry on so we formed the ancient Cumbrian society and then i set that up as a charity and i i got a grant to be a charity manager and we carried on for a while and then eventually um, the money come to the end and to be fair i just got exhausted I, I i just got to a stage where i had to go and have a rest so i i sort of slowed it all down and uh, went off at a rest and and recently i've come back and started to do a few bits yes. and so we're we're off again wow. <laughs> And the, the website is still around, is it? Come yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Nigel, Nigel Thomas, uh, a committee member of the Ancient yeah. Cumbrian Society, he runs the website. It's uh, Ancient Cumbrian Society. You tap that in, Google it, you'll get there. No problem at all. And you'll find some of the papers you mentioned, like from some of the stuff in these woods, etc. There's so archaeological reports published. on that website, and there's all sorts of bits of information. I just wrote a piece up about our testing of the walls you, you know what i told you earlier yeah i just put a piece up about that and we'll put the results up there once we uh, once we get yeah. up but um if we if we do come up with that sort of date yeah uh, it starts up ask is it, i mean the thing with archaeology right to do an archaeological dig what you've got to do first you've got to say to yourself what do I, what's, what question do I want to answer? Because it is like a detective thing, you know? You, you're trying to answer a question. You've got a question about a site. What is this? What's it for? Yeah? So that's where you start, right? So, but the thing is with archaeological digs, yeah? It, answer, it might answer the question, yeah? But it'll also give you six more. Yeah? So every question leads to a pile more questions, yeah? So, yeah, if this is, uh, we know there's a Bronze Age site there, yeah, and and now maybe we know there's a very early Christian or very late Druidic site there. Maybe not even Druidic or Christian. Maybe 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 the Romans built a boundary wall down through Cumbria. I doubt it. Didn't follow their style or, or their. It doesn't follow their style. And there's another thing about the Romans: they were awful superstitious. They were awful scared of mounds and things like that. They didn't like stuff like that. They they were totally freaked by this a whole island, you know. This uh, what did they describe it as? The, the misty isle, the misty green isle. They were scared from the, scared right from the beginning here, you know. That's why they ended up going up to Anglesey and. And hacking all the druids to death, like you know, because they were frightened of them. So it doesn't look like Roman. Now, if it's early Christian, now that would be really strange because it's too early. But there is plenty of theories out there that Christianity starts in South Wales first, and it's year really early. There's plenty of people who will tell you that Christianity is here in the first and second century. Officially, it's not a year to sort of third, fourth, but you know, who knows? Maybe wrong. The one thing I've learned over the years is um, you best keep an open mind, or you're gonna look awful stupid. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you, you talk, you, you see this sort of openness on things. You know, you're always like challenging, and, and that's part of publishing papers, isn't it? I suppose publishing papers. Can what's been done the thought about it because people can challenge it and think about it and yeah, yeah. add new I, I, I love my idea yeah um roger birchall our archaeologist yeah he love a different idea you've got a full respect to roger he's he's he's, he's a he's a, a a very experienced archaeologist 
So he'll have his idea of how things are, and and mm. I'll have my idea, and Nigel, who's another committee member, have a, a different idea, and Mike, who's the chairman of the Ancient Combrand Society, he'll have another idea, and Godfrey, who's another committee member, will have a different idea, you know? Mm. We all have different ideas, and, and anybody can come up with a theory, but all you can do is just like plod along and try to build the facts mm. and see what comes out, mm. you know? And it's a never-ending story, really, isn't it? Because, like, where does it end? Because archaeology just moves forward and, and historical theories get proved and disproved and, and eventually, eventually, well, you know, you, you just come up with more and more information. I mean, there's, it's not so long back that they thought that there was no stone building in Wales until the Normans turned up. You know, that we couldn't build in stone. And it wasn't so long ago, in fact, we're talking within our lifetime, they thought there was no roads in Britain until the Romans turned up. It's how, we, no, it's, how, it's how we started today to talk about, you know, the, the roads and pathways that were needed for yeah, trade. It's obvious, really, <laughs> isn't it? It's blatantly obvious, you know, otherwise you couldn't trade. You don't move goods on a footpath like this. Yeah, you, 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 you wouldn't get a chariot down here, would you? You wouldn't get a horse and cart down this, through this woods. And you, and you know what Wales is like. I mean, it's a nightmare to get anywhere if you didn't have a road. But, um, yeah, and, and, and since then, that same Professor Ray Howell, I believe he'd done a dig on a Roman road just behind Clee and between Cure and Lodge Hill. And they, 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 they uncovered a medieval road and they went down through the medieval road and they found a Roman road and they went down through the Roman road and they found an older road underneath that. And so, I was just by here, you know. So the Romans weren't... Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, First were their roads. No, someone, someone was always building roads. I mean, there's some ancient old British books. Uh, some of them are disputed as being... Um, uh, actually ancient and some people say they're, they're much younger and they're fables you know but there's a story about uh, Bellinus and Brutus who who, uh, who commissioned roads west to east and north to south across Britain and uh, you're back in the Bronze Age then you know so who knows I mean Lodge Hill used to be called um, Bellinus Stockade I think And Brutus is is, uh, is, um, is credited with the building of London. So, where are we going to come out now? Where are we going to come out? Oh, we're this is um, top of Teagwin Way. Oh yeah, oh, it's good down. Road, Teagwin yeah. Way. Let's walk down. So I'll just it'd be nice for us to finish to show exactly where we've come out. Yeah. And we can. Um, oh yeah, I can see exactly where we are. You mentioned earlier about the um about, about down the Tesco Express down there. Oh look, see that ridge of land over there? Yeah? That's Wentwood Forest. Yeah. Uh, Wentwood Forest is just just about there with our veers, there's a grey hill. A grey hill's got standing stones on it and walled enclosures made out of quartz conglomerate. Very similar to this. Just the other side of the valley. The road here, Tesco Express down there, this is where we've popped out. Uh, quite an unusual, funny th place to finish on. Um, when we were talking about one of the, um, the bail site near the top, we were wondering why this sort of position. Are you describing looking over towards towards the water? Towards then, the Severn. The homes? Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I used to live, see the Severn down there, can we? Well, I used to live on Wellington Drive, the house on the end. Just poking out there. Oh, that's so my nice. house probably blocked that view that you were, you were talking about. This one right here? The one on the end of the, on the, end of the green, the far corner, yeah, number yeah. 21, I think it was, yeah. We did um, many years Mike ago. Mike Price lives there now, uh, the chairman of the Age of Cumbrad Society. The house on, on the very end? On the yeah, side, the first one the here. The corner? On the right-hand side of it. As you walk on the footpath, it's the house in front of you. Oh, no, the, the, Mike lives across the road <laughs> on the end one. <laughs> so my house, my picture. Do you know that used to be a pig farm? Yeah, the master room's built on a pig farm. 
when I was a kid, I used to work on the pig farm, mucking out the pigs. And we used to call Green Meadow Woods the Hogwood because it was always pigs running around in there eating the beech nuts. <laughs> and if you, if you come across a sow with a litter, she'd attack you. You know, it was really Scary. dangerous, airy place for a kid, really. But, and the farmer used to shoot at us and set his dogs on us as well. Because this estate then, this byways estate, this is the very top of it, isn't it? Yeah. And Rushbrook were there. That was the last estate sticking up the mountain. The Bowleys wasn't there, the Barnards wasn't there, the Masaru wasn't there, the school wasn't there. Nothing was up here. The road didn't even come up this far. This road wasn't here. <laughs> I remember them building that road. So it was like 1967, you know, and we were sticking up this wilderness, really. It was a wilderness, all these overgrown farms. The pig farm. <laughs> yeah, and the pig farm. And uh, we used to work on the pig farm up there, mucking out his pigs. And he'd give us a few shekels for our hard work. <laughs> <laughs> right, cheers to Jack. It's been pretty, it's been lovely. It's been, it's been very, very lovely comments about your knowledge and stuff. And I'm sure, um, yeah, a few people with questions to ask, if you pop them in the comments, we'll get them checked out. Yeah. Um, I'll pop the link into the Ancient Command Society into the comments as well. And then in a few days, I'll pop the link on the website um, just for, you know, why you're sort of sharing, really. But yeah, it's been a brilliant well, an hour, an hour and a half, whatever we've had. Yeah. If you take this from, you know, from, well, the Golden Harvest <laughs> right back to you know, three and a half thousand years ago, um, yeah. and we're going to find some interesting facts from the, from the archaeology report that should be done in the next few months. Yes. So keep an eye on it. About three time. months. But, yeah. I was hoping we'd have it for Christmas, though, you know, but maybe not. Just... Might have to wait till January. But yeah, cheers for your time. Have a lovely evening. I'm going to stop the video now. But this has been a yeah, great comments. You'll see them afterwards and people, lots of people saying thanks and stuff. So yeah, it's been good fun. All right. Take thank care. You. Thank you very much.